70. I feel like I have a big white beard <laughs> coming down. Ah, oh, wow, it was, it was humbling, yeah. It, it seemed to stir my memory in a, in a very, very interesting way. I was looking at things that I hadn't seen for 40 years or so, and, and when they came up, it was like, oh, yeah, like I remember this, this piece. And it, it wasn't so much that the pieces were, you know, brilliant or important or anything, but they were just very memory stirring. And what was happening also was when we were looking at the prints when I was doing it, and Otis was there, we were both from that same period at the studio, and he, he, I think he was feeling the same thing. And we started going, hey, do you remember when this happened? And, and what was the story about that person? And, and then we sort of actually even got into gossiping and filling in stories. Like he knew one version of something and I was going, no, I thought it was like this. And then, you know, it was that. So the, the way the, the work stirred our, our memory was, I thought, really interesting. It was like, you know, Marcel Proust's um, book on, you know, eating the Madeleine and the lime tea, and then it just took him right back in time to some other place. It had that sort of feeling of just suddenly being transported back to this period. Now looking, I mean, having the privilege of going through that, those archives, I was just stunned. I was just humbled, totally. Uh, There's so much good work. Um, and it just brought back memories to the point of almost tears. Looking over the, um, uh, the prints was definitely a journey back in uh, time. Uh, it also was really interesting because I realized at uh, how much we didn't know about uh, what other people were uh, doing. So we were, you know, to a certain extent cocooned. It was a difficult time. Uh, um, very little in the way of, uh, of other means of support. Uh, and so we were each group, open studio, aggregation gallery, the theaters, whatever, we were cocooned to a certain extent to make sure that we supported ourselves. And so I did recognize that a lot of things that Open Studio were doing I wasn't familiar with. So that was a really um, an eye-opener to discover the work, uh, the amount of work, and the um, collection of people involved in, uh, in uh, the studio. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was nice to see it. <laughs> The art scene in Toronto in, in the late 60s and early 70s was, was much smaller than uh, it is now, considerably smaller, and also uh, in a period of uh, growth. And um, however, at the time, you could go to an uh, exhibition in Toronto or go to a theatre production or a music production and be pretty well assured that you're going to run into <laughs> uh, uh, so many people that you already uh, knew or were familiar with because it was a much more connected between the disciplines, it was a much more connected community then. Uh, uh, as the growth of the city and the arts community uh, developed, those naturally those things needed more space of their own and, and uh, so there was some uh, disconnection from that kind of small community. It almost felt like a small town community uh, and was, I think, pretty supportive at the time of one another in the disciplines. Uh, and um, uh, it was um, definitely a fun, uh, hard, but fun and exciting period. In the 70s, there was a, a leaning towards abstract elements as well and or at least um, neat sort of semi-abstract works and that that was a really big deal. Color was very popular mainly because um, people liked it and um, a lot of uh, corporate um, collections were starting up at the time and uh, people were buying work for you know the TD Bank and, and various law firms and all sorts of things and this was becoming a really great way to sell printmaking because it was inexpensive but still very fine art and, and uh, unique and so on. The studio uh, was, was a real hub. 
and uh, there were people from all over. There were poets, there were photographers, uh, filmmakers, uh, there were painters, sculptors, um, printmakers per se, who were just printmakers. It, the whole place was a hub. And uh, people would come up and they would look and say, wow, what a setting. We'd go, to, we'd go out to places and, um, and sort of hang out. Uh, the Spadina Hotel was, was kind of a cool spot. And um, there were other arts groups, like there was one called ARC that was, I forget what it stands for, but they were doing a lot of group exhibitions and would often be very inclusive and show printmakers' works as well as other people's works. And then the gallery scene was really different as well, where it was located for one thing, which is, you know, in general, around downtown Toronto, at the Isaacs Gallery in Yorkville and so on. So there was a lot of, a lot of activity around those galleries and in that area at the time. came here at a very young age as a student still. Uh, the studio was just beginning. It, it was, uh, the foundation was just being laid. The graining sinks were being built and the screen uh, printing tables were being pushed in. And uh, I came down for an open house to see what this place was about. And uh, right away, I was just uh, embraced by the environment actually seeing in a live time situation, presses and artists and lithographic stones. It no longer was a, uh, a student sort of outlook. It became a professional outlook. And I said to myself, wow. <laughs> uh, I asked uh, the directors at that time, uh, it was Richard Sewell, who was basically running primarily everything. And Don Holman was just uh, reaching in as the uh, home lithographer who came up from Kansas. Uh, and I talked to both of them and I said, boy, could I work here? Uh, I have one year left uh, on my uh, program at the uh, University of Windsor. If uh, they allow it, could I finish it here? And both of them, I mean, were very, uh, I thought, uh, adept thinkers and uh, expansive thinkers. And they, uh, they said, for, sh for sure, no problem at all. Uh, so we were of the same uh, generation as those who uh, uh, were involved at the beginning of Open Studio, which was you know, a few years later um, after um, uh, we opened. Uh, and like us, they, I think, also started in, uh, or you started in a um, small storefront location. Uh, and it was possible to do that in uh, downtown uh, Toronto, in the older neighborhoods that were somewhat derelict at the uh, at the time, and um, just as you know, things were entering a period of um, growth in the city. Uh, so we were at the beginning of that. Open Studio was at the beginning of that. It was an exciting, a really exciting uh, and um, regenerative period of Toronto. I was uh, recently graduated from York University uh, where I had studied printmaking. And I was, you know, very young and just out of school and was just trying to figure out what to do with myself, basically, like where to how to make work, was I going to be an artist even, you know, what was I going to do with myself? And uh, I found out about Open Studio because my printmaking instructor from York was somewhat connected with it and, and I thought I really liked printmaking and I thought maybe I'll just go and do some and see how things go, you know, how, how they work out. So I, I started making uh, prints at Open Studio and, and uh, it, it became something that uh, I ended up being with for quite a long time. So um, I guess that's how I started. And, um, and then uh, one thing led to another <laughs> after that. It was really quite a formative period for me and I was only like 22 or something like that. And I, I found it was a place that became a sort of almost like a postgraduate 
form of study where I was working, you know, doing something that I was enjoying and making work, but also seeing other people work and um, watching, you know, how these people were being artists and being printmakers. And it wasn't as if people were sort of telling you things all the time, but you just kind of were in an environment where you could really um, observe and, and participate in a really interesting kind of way, a very, very, very helpful way, actually. The way uh, that a lot of artists uh, happened to, to come into Open Studio was from the Spadina Hotel, where uh, Don, uh, myself, and Don Phillips would sit around and have a beer to re reflect on art and things like that in the bar. And the next guy sitting beside us would say, hey, you guys are talking art. I, I've done art before. And Don would say, well, what do you do? And he says, well, I, I'm a trapper from North Bay, and uh, I, I, I got long days. I sit around waiting, and I do little sketches of animals. And Don would say, perfect, come on. We're going to do a print at Open Studio. And the guy would go, wait a minute, wait a minute. i got to finish my drink. And, uh, and, and this is how some of the artists came about, and Don would invite uh, all sorts of people to come and print. Uh, I mean, they couldn't print, but we'd print for them. They would do the artwork. Um, and then, of course, there was people that were renters, and uh, they would print their own work. So there, it was those three channels. Uh, and also there was this celebrative prints, like, like the Fenwick Lansdowne print, to uh, com uh, commemorate an occasion. And there was the um, print, the very first print we did for uh, Gordon Smith, the very first one we did for him. Uh, it, it was to be presented to all the uh, winners of the Nobel Peace Prize. So it was very, very special. I think the first thing that you felt, you know, in terms of the physical atmosphere was just the, the smell of the place, which was rather nice in a way, you know, these sort of chemical smells and so on, and so you're kind of involved in that when you came in, and um, usually it was kind of quiet, you know, there'd be people working quietly in some area, printing or doing something. Um, it was never like a, a massive activity. People would come and go during the day, and um, sometimes there'd be some activity with printing, like some commercial or, or custom printing um, process that was going on, and there'd be a lot of talking and yakking in some area, like in the usually in the litho area um, and <laughs> the other thing about it you know in the 70s well we were not really aware of all of the dangers of working with these the kinds of materials and things that we were using and it, sometimes we'd come in and <laughs> the silk screeners used a big arc lamp to process their photographic images on their screens and Sometimes this arc lamp would just be kind of be blasting away in the middle of the studio, this light coming off it and this kind of electric sound, you know, this buzzing and so on. And there'd be kind of sounds and things like that going on. Um, scrubbing and washing coming from the silk screen cleanup room and various other things happening. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh yes, I picked them out too. I, I, they were like game changers. Um, the prints, if I can show them in a second, uh, I don't mind showing them and just telling you why I picked them out. Um, they uh, were monumental to me because what I just uh, talked about, the fact that I wasn't very excited about all the art that we were doing. A lot of it was people trying to copy what they were famous for, like copy a painting they did or a drawing they did. And there was no excitement in that, and there was no adventure. There was no, there was no change uh, in it. But when I uh, worked with um, York Wilson, who was at that time older than I am now, and I was quite young, York Wilson was probably in his late 70s, and he just had heart surgery, but he kind of found it, migrated to the studio in a funny way, and he said, I'd sure like to try some lithographs. And we, uh, we showed him the process, and the guy, like, 
turned into a teenager. He had all this sort of ability to make decisions, do color changes, he was interested in textures, and he would dabble with things ahead of time, and he'd say, oh, I could do that on the stone. And, and uh, we got into uh, beautiful, pristine colors, and he had an incredible eye. So he was like the first one that kind of broke the, that uh, timid barrier that a lot of people didn't want to really show who they really are by working on a litho stone. Uh, it's a pick and a pen, and William Crudlick was um, born on a farm, grew up on a farm, and uh, so often his subjects would return to, or he would return to looking at the farm or the memories of the farm, and this is a pig uh, sticking its head out of the pen, and uh, there's a bucket on one side, and there's a little slip of uh, probably metal on part of the pen. It's very small. It looks like a post-it note. Uh, and I want to say it's a post-it note because it's colored. Uh, it's got kind of an orangey, pinky color uh, to it. And then the bucket has these ridges in it uh, that are uh, the same color. And I believe that there's other color that the nose of the pig uh, has been, um, uh, uh, is, is more pink. And it, the, the print is called I'm Beautiful. So he beautified it. <laughs> he made it more beautiful. Well, it, it, as far as, like Otto would probably say to him, no, no, it's fine the way it is. Uh, you don't need, to, it's beautiful the way it is. You don't need to add color. But when, uh, obviously when Corellic got it back to his studio, he added the color. <laughs> and Otis actually seemed a little frustrated, you know, many years later with the fact that he did that. And I thought that was um, a nice anecdote of, you know, uh, of this dynamic between the master printer, also an artist, and the artist uh, who was uh, learning the process along with the master printer and making this work. We would travel uh, to work constantly by streetcar from Ronsonsville along the King Line and you'd see signs plastered everywhere. Harold Clunder, Harold Clunder, it was fantastic. He was self-promoting himself in the uh, early 70s. So you, you knew the name, but I'd never met Harold. But when he came to the studio, it was like, wow, you're the guy. <laughs> you know, the thousand posters out there. And then uh, he said, yeah, I'd like to try some lithographs. And he was an abstract expressionist and, uh, in, a, in a very serious way. He said, uh, can you guys just uh, grain me some stones and we'll put uh, all of them on the floor. So we had like 12 stones on the floor. <laughs> Going, this is good. And he would mix up the touches that we showed him how to do. And uh, we would also give him a few uh, odd washes that had maybe solvent in them so that the washes would explode more when the water and the solvent hit. They combust almost and create all these in incredible textures. And he just went at it like, uh, uh, like um, a sushi chef, just and, and made incredible marks and, and you just kind of go wow this guy can change your life in five minutes just watching him and the, the work was uh, was beautiful so an artist who uh you know really resonated with me and who i remembered very well was was brian kelly and his work and uh, brian was the uh the next director of the etching area after eugene let's say left and um he he was um very very uh helpful and very inclusive. You know, he really um, engaged people who worked there. He was very talkative and very helpful. And um, this was really a great thing because um, some people were shy when they started working there and he kind of incorporated everybody into, into the place. And he also um, did a lot of projects such as uh, he made books where everybody in the studio did a print and then they put these books together and so on. So I always um, felt he'd had a, a very large and influential effect on me, you know, in terms of helping me and kind of adjust to being an artist, I guess, or, you know, and just kind of get into that sort of life. And so when I, when I saw his work, uh, when we were looking at it, it it's, again, it kind of that memory thing all kind of came back because I haven't seen his work for quite a long time. And I especially hadn't seen these black, prints that he made that were done with mesotint and, um, and it's, it's sort of like kind of like, oh, oh those 
these prints in it. It just kind of struck me, you know, they were still incredibly beautiful, I thought, and had not um, become uh, out of date or sort of passe or something. You know, they still struck me as being incredibly beautiful works. He was, you know, even though a lot of people were using color at the time, especially in litho and silkscreen and even in etching, you know, I was working with color. He was very, um, you know, he was, he was very interested in the traditional aspects of, of printmaking and not afraid of it, you know, not afraid to work with these black images and do still lifes only using black and so on. And, and um, so there was, um, yeah. So anyway, that's what I remember was mainly his, his generosity and, and also just the incredible beauty of his work, I thought was, was a, you know, just sort of came back to me in a big rush. I haven't seen him for many years, but you know, it's, it was kind of, it was almost like seeing him again or something. Uh, and then the other artist was Fenwick Lansdowne, who uh, we would call him a bird artist, an ornithologist of, of incredible reputation. And, uh, and he had polio, and he had to come up the elevator shaft every morning and uh, work on these um, stones that were prepared for him. And he was such a gentleman and, and very, very uh, fragile but he just loved talking about the stone and what he, you can do. And he was drawing a varied thrush. This was for a book that they were gonna release uh, for a, a special edition that was gonna be leather bound. And they really wanted something special in the book. And I'm, I, I was very pleased that he could recognize that doing a real lithograph was special. Because prior to that, probably the only other artist that did a real lithograph of, of nature or of uh, ornithology studies was probably Audubon. I think that's the funny thing about um, this process, and, and maybe it is what art is about, really, that it is about remembering and uh, how visually we can be um, made to respond to something uh, without words. You know, you just kind of, you know, are sort of taken somewhere just by looking at this visual thing and somebody has made it that way, you know, that's really interesting.